Okay, so let's start with today's research seminar. So it's a pleasure for us to have Luis Kenoni here today with us. Luis is an assistant professor at the Department of Political Sciences, University College London, and an affiliated professor at the Centro, Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económicas, the CIDE, CIDE in Mexico, in Mexico. So his research deals with a very interesting topic. Uh, which has to do with state building and international conflict. His work is mostly focused on Latin America, and he has already published in the American Journal of Political Science, International Studies Quarterly, Security Studies, and Democratization, among other journals. Luis received his PhD in political science at the University of Notre Dame and was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Constance. Today, he will be presenting his new work, I understand, The Unbearable Lightness of War in 19th Century Latin America. So, uh, as usual, we are going to give the floor to Luis, who will be speaking for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for questions and answers. Uh, with the audience. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank Andrea and Matthias and other friends uh, here at Debate for this kind invitation uh, to come for Barcelona, which is kind of a dream for a young academic to, to spend a, a weekend out and be able to share uh, these thoughts at a place like, uh, like eBay, where so many uh, people working in, in, this, in this topic. Uh, this, this work talks about a bit to Andreas and to Matthias' work, some of Matthias' co-authors like Fidel Soifer and others that are working on this topic of state building in Latin America, as you will, you will see. So um, I'm very, very interested in, in your um, your feedback, actually, on, on your questions to, to see what directions this book project basically can, can take in the future and how you feel about this, these ideas. So Andrea, would have 40 minutes or 30 minutes? Okay. So, okay, I'll try to talk for, for then, uh, some 40 minutes and, and leave the rest for, for questions and, and answers um, and your comments. So, <clears throat> my work concentrates mostly on uh, basically state building in Latin America during the 19th century. And the gist of this, of this book project that comes out of my dissertation and uh, partly has already been published, and what I will present to you mostly will be a like, new paper out of this, but which eventually will become a, a, a chapter of this book. Um, so this, this whole project focuses on, on how war made, have made the state or not in Latin America uh, throughout history, and is pitched against what I call this anti bellicist narrative that dominates the scholarship in Latin America. So basically, um, you might be familiar with this idea, most famously proposed in the late 20th century by Charles Tilly, but it traces back to Max Weber and Otto Hinze and other uh, you know, uh, famous scholars of the so-called German school of the state formation, uh, that war is the major force driving the formation of uh, contemporary national states, because states to fight these wars, they need to uh, put on a standing army on its feet. This costs money. They have to tax the population. Taxing the population requires a certain bureaucracy to administer this this money and to apply taxation or, or what sociologists usually call extraction, and that generates the basic uh, kind of. Uh, backbone of, of the state and then other ramifications of state, what, what we now think of the state um, uh, functions, basically like education or, uh, or health uh, provision or even pension provision, they all kind of can, can be in a way traced back to this martial ex experiences, right? Um, this is a very consolidated narrative all, all over the world, even in tracing back to studies of the formation of the Chinese state, uh, of, of the Qing during the, the warring state periods in China. Um, but in scholarship about Latin America, it hasn't been taken uh, seriously at all. It, famously, one um, student of Charles Seeley at Columbia, uh, Miguel Centeno, wrote a couple of articles in a book in the late 
uh, 1990s, early 2000s, saying that this narrative doesn't uh, apply to Latin America because Latin America uh, had experienced limited war and uh, never this kind of total wars of Europe and Asia that led to the formation of the contemporary kind of 20th century post-World War II states and that we see today. Um, so around this initial, initial ideas by Centeno, a consensus has formed in the literature about Latin America that war didn't make these states because of these reasons in the, in that are presented here in this slide. Some of them, I think of them as the as people that think the, the cause itself is absent, that there is war couldn't have made the state or explain the way I think about this variation of, um, among state capacity within Latin America, in, in state capacity within Latin America, because of wars not being frequent enough, uh, because of wars being limited in comparison to wars in other uh, you know, geographies and in other times, and because war didn't lead to the out selection or didn't kill weak states, right? In the, in the European narrative, even in the you know, warring state Chinese <coughs> uh, narrative, um, the one of the main mechanisms people have developed is that, that uh, war would be a, a, a mechanism for the out selection of the weak states, so that the, the, the strong states tend to survive because weak, weak states are eliminated by war. This clearly didn't happen in Latin America. So <clears throat> some people think of uh, this absence of the cause uh, as the reason why the, the theory doesn't apply to the region. And others, and sometimes people agree on both, <clears throat> think about the absence of, what they call the absence of the mechanism. That even if war was present, so the cause was initially present, the way wars were fought in Latin America were, were not conducive to state capacity or state formation because war was fought in a fundamentally different manner. And some people have kind of uh, made this explanation travel to most of the third world in general to argue that this is a dynamic that replicates not just not not just in Latin America but all over the in, you know, least developed world. Um, and and this part of, of the argument goes as as the, the, uh, presented here. Right? That first wars in, in these regions are usually uh, paid by foreign taxes to foreign trade and therefore the states don't need to extract from the local population or the domestic uh, populations or from society, as some, some people in sociology put it. Uh, so there was this external source of, of, of taxation, of revenue through taxation of, of foreign uh, capital. And also there was a foreign source of financing through uh, basically foreign loans. That, was, that were, in theory, available for, for Latin American states to fight this war. So even if there is a drive to extract from the population that might be universal for every state that faces an external foe and an enemy, in Latin America it was very easy to resort to these external sources of finances and therefore uh, wars were fought, but they didn't lead to state formation because of this, uh, this uh, external uh, available sources. And the corollary of, of, uh, of, of this approach is that one other thing that was avoided uh, was conflict with local elites. Um, beca precisely because these external sources of finance were, uh, were available, states in, 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 in Latin America didn't have to fight entrench local elites to extract any sort of revenue from them. Uh, and they could avoid this type of conflict. Whereas in the traditional you know, European narrative, you have this idea of <clears throat> the king extracting from the lords and, and fighting, uh, you know, and noblemen all over the, the French countryside to, 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 to impose some sort of taxation on, the, on this, this uh, local elites, right? In, in the Latin American narrative, basically the idea is that this kind of conflicts <clears throat> didn't take place, uh, at least not as much, because external sources were, were available. So in, in my previous okay. in my previous work, I, I tried to think about why this uh, Bellicist approach is not applicable to to 
or has, has been taught as not applicable to Latin America. And I went, what I realized by reading and rereading this book is that people were representing Bellis's theory in, a, in particular ways that actually don't apply to Latin America, but don't represent what I call the classical Bellis's theory, like the early Chile, but also Hinze, Weber, and all this Oppenheimer, all of this basic, this, uh, this early German scholars very well. So <clears throat> one way of thinking about Bellis's theory is this pure selection uh, theory, where, or out selection theory, where the idea is essentially that war would eliminate uh, weak states and through this mechanism that build stronger state capacity in the long run. This clearly <coughs> uh, might have happened in, 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 in the way, for instance, uh, Hedrick Street and others think about the European process of state formation, might have happened in other places, but this clearly didn't take, take place in Latin America. <coughs> uh, we know that you know, the states that came out of, uh, of ind independence wars were even fewer than the states that we see today in the region. So if, if anything, there was a multiplication of national states rather than a contraction because of, you know, in court, like in the Prussian and German story, right, where, where one state eats the weak ones and, and, and therefore the, 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 the system becomes overall more stronger in terms of state capacity, right? So this, this first, uh, this would be state capacity levels and this would be the period time basically where one state doesn't prepare for war, it's another state prepares for war and this one is self-selected at the moment of war. This, this has not applied to Latin America. The other understanding of Bellis's theory is, uh, is what I call the preparation for war uh, mechanism or the preparation for war logic, which basically uh, thinks of peacetime as a, as a period where no state capacity is built and then the period of war, as a period where state capacity will be formed, because you need these armies, this taxation, etc., and then a, a sort of ratchet effect will take place at the at the end of the process and stabilize at new levels of state capacity. This is also very not very intuitive to understand Latin America because we we know in, in Latin American scholarship that state capacity in different countries has evolved in different trajectories, and this traces back to the work of, of James Mahoney and, and others that uh, you know you. There is no overall jump in state capacity in Latin America at the moment of the wars, right? <clears throat> so my understanding, and I think it's, it's a proper representation and the theory chapter of this book, uh, I'm, I'm working on basically uh, tries to, to make this point, is that actually what, what this, uh, these interpretations of, of Bellis' theory are, are missing and, the way, and why they cannot be mapped back to Latin America and show that actually the, the Bellis' theory works in Latin America the, the, the reason why they don't work is because they are missing this post-war kind of uh, moment where you would have different state uh, trajectories in the formation of state capacity in a post-war period depending on the outcome of the war. So basically a state will not build capacity as long as it's not fighting wars, but it will build capacity when, when during preparation for war. And then if the state is victorious, then probably this process will be legitimated and they will continue to build capacity in that trajectory. And if not, <coughs> uh, probably the, the state capacity project and say our actors will be contested and, and the state capacity will go, will go down uh, in a downward trajectory. In, in my previous work, I, I have tried to map this back to the 19th century. All of the work that is being done on the, basically on state formation in, in the 19th century in Latin America is, uh, or basically all of the work on state formation in Latin America at the moment is focusing on the 19th century. The, the last book by Sebastián Mazuca came out last, last year is also focusing on this particular period because there is a general recognition then that state capacity in, in, in this particular region formed in, during that era. And more, more specifically between the 1860s and uh, the 1910s basically. And whatever happened afterwards, uh, you know, was uh, basically a continuation of trajectories that were set up previously or not much state, of the state building. Which, by the way, is kind of supportive of the Bellicist theory because the, the most important wars in Latin America were fought in the late 19th century, right? <clears throat> but uh, uh, following this, this recent tradition of the last 10, 15 years of looking at the 19th century in my work, I also focus on, on the effect of wars in this particular period in time, right? And what, I, what I've seen in, and this is uh, in, in this HAPS article that Andrea was, was mentioning before, 
is that actually if you take the universe of, of cases in, in Latin America and you see, you try to, to trace the effect of uh, defeat in war in the post-war period basically or these diversions between victors and, and the defeated states in indicators of state capacity like for example railroad, railroad millage or revenue extraction. Uh, you would see that the what is happening is very similar to what I showed you uh, before here, that there is a, a clear diversion that is statistically significant and increasing in time between uh, the, the winners and the losers, right? So what I, you can see here is a, simply, a, for instance, a difference in means between the railroad millage of states that won wars and states that didn't win wars in the 19th century. Uh, in the late 19th century, this is from 1860 until 1914. Uh, and here you can see the divergence in, uh, in revenue collection, with this being the losers and this being the, this being the winners, and 95% confidence interval here in, in just a difference in mean. And you can do this a bit more sophisticatedly and, and try to see if, uh, for instance, try to model this uh, as, as a, a, different, a difference in differences, for example, including a lot of covariates that you might think that can explain uh, also, uh, either railroad millage or uh, revenue extraction, and you would find basically it doesn't matter really how you know how you specify this. You would find a, a significant effect um, that if you plot lags and leads of the treatment around this time, you cannot see it very well, but this is where the treatment will take place. <coughs> points to an increasing and statistically significant increasing difference between uh, the, the losers and the winners of, of wars in the post-war period after receiving this, this treatment of, in this case, the, the defeat in war. <clears throat> so this, this kind of proves the point that after war, this, this wars might have had this, this differential effect on, on these two groups. And this can be seen not just in, in, in a you know, model including all uh, 20 Latin American states in this case, but uh, also if you see the cases of this war uh, in, in individually and in, in particular, right? And you can you can do it in different ways, which in, in my book project basically are embedded in different chapters uh, that deal with the major wars. So one of the major wars in late 19th century Latin America was this Paraguayan war, where Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay basically fought Paraguay, and uh, this war in, in, in had was very consequential for the state building project of, of, of all of these countries, right? Because uh, all of these countries mobilized for war, um, and but only in the winners, basically, this resulted in the consolidation of the main state institutions like the army uh, and and the, the parties that were in favor of centralization of power <coughs> on the state and. Whilst in Paraguay, basically, the defeat ended up destroying the, uh, the coalition that had led to impressive state building since the 1850s around the, the well, first Caspar Francia and then the Lopez kind of dictators, uh, father and son, until this defeat. Uh, now, if you look at, for example, the dynamics during the war itself, again, this is very small here, I'm sorry for that. But what, what you, are, you are supposed to see here is basically a timeline and events during the war of, uh, this, the timeline of the war, uh, the Triple Alliance of the Paraguayan War, and, and events, whether there was a big military defeat uh, of either the Allies or Paraguay in, in the battlefield. And you can see actually the shift in coalitions, whether the uh, supporters of the state building project were reinforced or not by these events in the very, very short term. So you can see kind of an immediate treatment effect there uh, in its qualitative manner uh, of, of how war, external war, determined the strength of the local parties. So for, to put just one example in Argentina, uh, when Argentina goes to the war, and we will remember this, uh, basically President Mitre was, was the major, you know, uh, representative of this state building coalition and you know building a national army that was in a way subduing even during the war like regional uh, reactions to uh, 
most uh, to to the consolidation of power in the national state, most famously or Urquiza, right? But this was after Pavón, and and but then there was this big defeat of Purupaiti in during the Paraguayan War, where the Argentine army was decimated, uh, and uh, yeah, basically a lot of elite families in, in Buenos Aires lost their children there, and it was, it was a big crisis for the project. And that was immediately followed by uh, basically a collapse of Buenos Aires hegemony over the country and the, the rise of the, uh, <coughs> the Varela uh, revolution in the, in the Cujo, in, in, the, in Mendoza, in the, in, the eastern, in the western region of, of the country, uh, which almost leads to the defeat in the war and to the collapse of this state building project. But th there was a turn uh, of, of, the, of luck later on in the war which ends up consolidating this, uh, the army and the, the party of, of Midre. And in, in the end, this, this coalition between state builders and, uh, and the army that builds at the end of the war ends up being the basis of the party that led Argentina to its most impressive period of state building and economic growth, which is the Partido Autonomista Nacional, the PAN forms precisely at the very end of, of this war with the presidency of Sarmiento, right? And will govern Argentina until the 1920s or 1910s. <clears throat> so you can see that in the, in the, in the, within the war, in the long term, if you see that, if you think about the trajectory of Argentina and Paraguay and those countries, comparing them within this war, and you can see that it, it, even statistically, if you think of uh, if you try to model, for example, this is with the synthetic control method, a potential counterfactual for the defeated state, right? So here you would have basically, this is the railroads of Paraguay, and this is the revenue of Paraguay, and this is how a country just like Paraguay would have looked like without being treated by defeat in this instance, right? With this diversion, as you can see, happening basically during the war. You can see how Paraguay was in an upward trajectory in terms of its revenue, pulled down by the war in a way, and, and, and a counterfactual Paraguay, made out of countries that look like Paraguay, uh, and averaging them, would have gone into a, a much more steeper state building trajectory as measured by this indicator. Now, this proves in a way that this last part of the, of the what I call the classical Bellicist theory story applies to Latin America, that the that if there is an effect of the war outcome, right? But th then there is this discussion about what happened when Latin American faced, uh, Latin American states faced an external threat. If this were important enough to have triggered the kind of state forming dynamics that we see in other places of the world. And this is what I haven't published yet, but it's another chapter of this book, which focuses on, on, on what I called before this absence of, or presence of the mechanism. So, according to, to the traditional, you know, the conventional wisdom, uh, you know, uh, this is what we would, ex this, this aid hypothesis is what we would expect to have happened in Latin America every time these states faced an external war or, a, or, or the threat of an external foe that could have ex escalated into a war. But this, the, the, the scholars often say something like, even in the context of limited war, Latin American states didn't resort to extraction from their local population because they didn't want to confront the elites. Therefore, they resorted to these other sources of external revenue and they avoided any conflict with, it, with local elites, right? So if you think systematically about how, what this implies, which is uh, basically the argument put forward by all of these big authors of the last uh, 10, 15 years in, the, in, in this literature, um, you, you can distill, in a way, this, this aid hypothesis. First, one would expect that facing an external threat, the Latin American states would have collected more foreign duties. Right? So the, the idea is uh, someone has to pay for this standing army that we're sending to the border or the ships that we need to, to fight the blockade or whatever it is that is triggered by the external threat. And the, the, what, what will become uh, the, the source of revenue would be mostly foreign duties. And, the, and this would increase uh, either because you know, more is traded or because, and this would be hypothesis two, uh, 
there was an increase in uh, tariffs, tariff levels during wars. Right? So if, if this is the main source of revenue that the state will use to fight wars, one would expect that there is a raise in tariffs during those, those periods. The third implication of this literature is that uh, basically states will go out and contract more uh, foreign credit uh, or uh, acquire more foreign loans to finance uh, this, this mobilization. Right? So if, if, again, your, these states couldn't tax the local population, didn't want to, do not, uh, uh, not confront local elites and, and, the, and, and, and the local uh, but no, or it's society in general, they're not extracting from society, then you would expect that either they would increase the search or they would uh, send a foreign diplomatic mission or something to, to London or wherever it was to, to, uh, to contract a new loan that would allow to pay for this for this war. Now what you wouldn't expect uh, is that these states would impose a cost in the, in the local population and get into uh, or tax domestically basically. And getting to that indicator is, is difficult um, because we know by reading just the history of these wars, there were there were many cases of um, local taxation to fight these wars. Uh, and in all of these major wars, uh, I, I talked a bit about the Paraguayan War, but also the War of the Pacific and others, you can see that there were either uh, force, what is, uh, uh, force tax, uh, taxation of, of uh, so, sorry, for force, ex, um, uh, loans kind of uh, imposed or first, first credit um, uh, imposed upon the, the local population or taxes, either taxes directed to the elites or to certain sectors in particular that were uh, thought to, to finance uh, these this campaigns in one way or another. Um, but this systematizing all of these taxes is, hasn't been done and, and it's not simple uh, to, to be done, although uh, something that one might think of developing some, some uh, a data project about. Actually, now I'm, I've been reading about Matthias data project. This is one of the ones that I would like to do at some point. Uh, so one has to think about a way around uh, this idea of local taxation. And one way in which these wars were usually financed at the time was by states instituting the curso por the, the, the of, of, of the local currency the, and basically exiting the gold pattern and devaluating the currency so that the state would have a bunch of, of, of gold or foreign currency that could uh, could use for the purposes of war, war fighting and reduce uh, the cost of domestic expenditures or the, the salary they paid to soldiers basically through what, what you, you might think of as an sort of inflationary tax. So, so using this, this kind of logic, you, you might think that states, one of, uh, one of the things that the current conventional wisdom doesn't expect is that the states facing a, a, these external threats will devalue their currencies. Because devaluating their currencies would mean basically an inflationary tax to the population, things that they didn't want to, to do, uh, this form of indirect uh, taxation but to, toward this sector of the <coughs> Also toward these domestic actors that they wanted to avoid taxing. Um, and then there are what I call the, some political mechanisms or political corollaries to this, to this uh, anti bellicist narrative that I was talking about. And this, this has to do with the idea that uh, in, the, in the event of the, confronting a foreign foe, uh, like an external threat, states in Latin America, rulers in Latin America, didn't want to uh, confront local elites. Uh, and and that was the main reason why they wouldn't tax them. Um, and all, but also they wouldn't confront them in, in different ways that could lead to, to domestic revolt. Like for example, they would refuse to, um, to conscript, for example, uh, ma in massively for the army because this would generate a reaction from uh, probably the, the people in general, all the local elites and therefore all of these things would have been avoided so that the, the expectation of the, the current literature would be uh, 
that in the context of an external war, you wouldn't have more domestic unrest. And you can dismantle this idea of domestic unrest in different ways. So you can think of uh, civil wars as a form of you know, big uh, domestic uh, uprisings that could happen in the context of external warfare. You could think of more limited and intra-elite kind of strifes that you would see in the case of uh, things like coup d'etat and it would, might happen during, during wars. And you might, might think of other categories of, of domestic conflicts that were in, in a data project that we have with uh, Raul Madrid, uh, professor at the University of Texas in Austin, we're trying to trace back all of this, what we call revolts in Latin America from the 1830s to the 1930s. And, and we define revolts in a much broader manner as uh, the digital and civil war does, because the civil wars are defined as events uh, of confrontation between two groups within the state or state and, and group in society that produces more than 1,000 battle deaths. And this is a, quite a high threshold for Latin America in the 19th century. So basically, we, we in this project, we're tracing uh, this, this revolts um, independently of the battle deaths, whether there was you know, uh, an, uh, an uprising basically against the state. And we have two categories in, in this uh, data set that so far covers this period uh, that I'm using for for the results that I will show you, uh, that are what we call popular uprisings. Uh, so these are revolts initiated by non-elite uh, sectors of society. And then we have what we call elite uh, or uh, factional rebellions, which are kind of more elite revolts, but not necessarily, uh, not, not necessarily coups, but elite revolts like would be like the, the secession of the province or the, 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 the insurrection of a party, like the, usually liberals and conservative parties would fight each other in the 19th century in Latin America, and those are the kind of things that we trace with those with the concept of elite revolt. But summarizing what you would expect according to the current literature is that when there is an external war, you wouldn't see any more, necessarily more coup d'etats or elite rebellions or popular uprisings or, or civil wars, it, because the state didn't impose costs upon the population, which would have triggered this kind of political unrest. Now, if Bellis's theory is, 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 is right, on the other hand, you would expect uh, that this, all of this, or most of this, might, might be triggered by, by, by an external conflict, a lot of political domestic unrest, people fighting the state because they don't want to be taxed or mobilized for war. And you probably would expect more of this, kind of domestic-oriented taxation, at least in the form of you know, inflationary ta ta uh, tax and, and kind of the use of seigneurage as a way of extracting revenue. And, and you, would, you might expect this as well, because basically uh, in, everywhere in the world at the time in the 19th century, wars were fought by, you know, by acquiring credit that would be either domestic or foreign, or uh, by, by tariffs because it was the main form of taxation everywhere in the world, not just in Latin America. 80% of revenue of France or Britain in, in the 1880s, for example, came from, from foreign taxes as well. So uh, now what the, this anti bellicist people would expect is that these are very, very significant. Right? That this, this, is the, this is where uh, the money is coming from. So if you see a war, you should see an increase in taxation and in, in tariffs, so an increase in foreign duties and an increase in, in the number of loans that are that, that Latin American states are contracting abroad. So what I what I do basically to, to kind of test this uh, arguments is I I look again at the same panel that I mentioned before of Latin America. Now I can look at it a bit more uh, extended in time because of uh, the variables I'm, I'm using for this model until basically the 1830s in some of the specifications, other until the, for others until the 18s, uh, or starting in the 1860s. But uh, what I'm basically trying to look at is the effect of militarized interstate disputes, which you may have heard this, about this concept before, but it's basically uh, a military confrontation that is at, at the very least the deployment of forces between two, two countries. Right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, a full-blown war, 
But in the logic that I was explaining before, these are events where an external country is deploying its army toward my borders, and I'm deploying the army toward the borders. So it already requires some form of mobilization and should trigger you know, this, this uh, red flags and, and send, you know, should prompt rulers to either send diplomatic missions to London to get money or uh, increase tariffs or implement these forms of taxation that we were thinking, uh, we're talking about before. Okay? Um, so this, these are militarized interstate disputes. So the different mo models are like a, a dichotomous, like whether there, was, there is one or not during that year. In other models, is a count variable, so where there was one, two, three, or four uh, militarized interstate disputes in that year. And then there are other databases that uh, build on this concept and and, uh, and, and basically, uh, yeah, check the reliability of the original MIT data set and. So this is the MIC, Militarized Interstate Conflict, that I said by a different author, but it's essentially the same concept, right? This, this external threat or uh, impending war that is happening. And then I have all the series of outcomes that I, you've seen in the hypothesis, right? So basically, a revenue uh, that is mostly uh, duty collection, the average tariff rates for a country, where the countries acquire a new loan or not in that same year, exchange rate uh, of the country, which is supposed to capture this policy of devaluation that indirectly would uh, you know, be a form of domestic taxation. Um, coups, account variable for coups, account variable for the number of elite rebellions, popular uprising that were happening at that time. A dichotomous variable for whether a, a civil war was taking place at that time. And then a series of, of controls and, and potential compounds that have to do with the basically the international economic context, which could affect some of the economic variables over there. Now we can discuss that a bit more after. Now, what is interesting, I think, of, of, is that I, I, I actually wasn't expecting that the findings would contradict so much what we think we know about the region in the, in the 19th century, but they, they actually do contradict the, this conventional wisdom quite a lot. Um, so what we see here is basically a result of um, lots of models that change basically the dependent variable in, in, in each of this. These are different specifications of the dependent variable with mix and mid, maybe these two things that I discussed before. And then basically a series of, of models, a baseline model on top, followed by a model with confounders, followed by a model with uh, the, the international economic confounders, all confounders, uh, two-way fixed effect model, which will be the square over here, and then a, a, lag, uh, a lag model. Um, so a model with the lag of independent variable. So the, um, independently of how you model this, what you, what you see is that the effect of Latin American fighting wars in a certain country year uh, in the 19th century was in fact apparently to decrease duty collection, and sometimes it was very statistically significant, to decrease tariffs, also sometimes with a statistically, statistical significance, right? And decrease the probability of contracting a new loan. You know, so always on this side of the, of the test. Whilst the effects are tend to be positive on the only variable that, which with which and this, I think, we can proxy domestic taxation, which is this devaluation. So it seems that actually, when they were facing external threats, systematically, what Latin American states did was to decrease their likelihood of actually contracting a new foreign loan or all these external sources of finance that we think they could access really easily, and increase domestic taxation. So this is this on the economic side. Apparently, the dialysis mechanisms work, uh, and all of this anti-dialysis narrative expectations don't that much. And on the political side of things, also fighting an external foe apparently increased the probability of domestic rebellion of different sorts. Uh, so the two that are the most significant, and these this results are even more impressive than the other ones, and, and, but immediately there could be some endogeneity here because you could think that, for example, because there was a civil war, some force crossed the border, this generated 
a skirmish with the with a neighboring you know, country or something like that. So, so there, there there could be an issue of endogeneity here. But in, in general, if kind of we just assume for a minute, uh, so it's the, the the endogeneity thing is also somehow dealt with by with, with the lag model and not some some sort of strategies over there. But let's assume for a minute that this this problem uh, uh, we can magically take it out of the of the box and. Then what, what we see is there is a constant association between uh, the, the event of these military interstate disputes and the probability of coups. So they tended to provoke in this reading uh, to the task. And this is always, this is at a very high level, an increase in civil war. So the idea that Latin American rulers, when facing an external threat, didn't have to fight their local population, so to, to fight this external threat, or this didn't have any effect on local political dynamics. Apparently, it also is completely wrong, right? There, there is there is clearly an effect there. Now there, yeah. Yes, for for this, for all of the last 20 minutes of the presentation, is every single country in Latin America from the 1830s until 1914. Uh, and and the, 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 the treatment variable is basically whether there is, or the country is involved in an international militarized dispute. So for all of the, so the winners and losers was when I was trying to get at the effect of the post-war period. And now I'm looking at the other part of the argument, which is whether states react immediately when there is war. But this is before even fighting. So some of these things didn't even become wars. Some of these things were just mobilization toward the borders, and, and then maybe the, the conflict diffuses or something. It, that, that will already be a military interstate dispute. Now, for the previous analysis, is okay, these are real wars, and there was a moment when the war ended, and there was a clear victor and a clear loser. Let's look at what's after. And for this is, okay, war hasn't even happened, but these this two countries are deploying forces, so Argentina, I don't know, 1944, 1844, sorry, I don't know, the, the British and the, the French, are sending troops to Uruguay, and this generates a militarized interstate dispute between the two countries. There was no war. There was more. It's often painted as a blockade of Buenos Aires, and whatnot. Uh, but this is this is something that should have prompted the government of I don't know Rosas at the time to mobilize because they he needed to buy ships and build you know uh, new ships or send troops to Uruguay or whatever. Um, so that's that's basically the logic. What we're looking at here is at the immediate effect of anything that could have become a war. Right? And this was precisely to, even for little events, right, to, to, to increase the probability of civil wars and fools. And so far, I got this mixed results for these other types of, of rebellions, which uh, in, in our classification, uh, so on the one hand, we're capturing very minor events. So this may be one of the reasons why these results are not very significant. But on the other hand, it may kind of make sense of it. So the ones that tend to be more significant are what we call popular uprisings, which are rebellions of, uh, as I said, non-elite actors. So it, this would be like rebellions of the peasants, uh, peasantry or rebellions of the um, indigenous groups or that. And this, this kind of rebellions tended to be, or theoretically one could think associated more with conscription and mobilization for war, right? Or, and even kind of relate to this inflationary effect that you know we, we picked up in the early war. So for example, this Varela rebellion during the Paraguayan war was famously triggered by an by the fact that Buenos Aires imposed the curso forzoso of the peso throughout the country and there was a high inflation. So this was one of the reasons why in the historiography this rebellion happened. And these are the kind of rebellions that you, you see a bit more happening in a, in the context of war, while elite rebellions seem to either not be affected by war or even be disencouraged by war, this is a bit more in line with what the, the, the current interpretation right? that the idea that maybe rulers avoided confronting, in particular, elites uh, when they were facing an external threat. So it, it might be that taxation was domestic still, but maybe more indirect and not directed toward elites. But this is things that still, at this level of abstraction, is difficult to pick up on. Um, 
But again, this is broadly in line with this this fetishist narrative, that wars force states to tax domestically and to confront the opposition to the state building project or uh, the national army and, and the process that is triggered by the, by the external conflict. So this raises the question of why, why, why would, in why, Why did Latin American states, in, in, in first of all, I mean, did, did not only apparently the current narrative is wrong in that uh, Latin American states were, did not have an, an easy time accessing all these foreign sources of revenue, uh, but also probably they, they access this this for this foreign sources of, of revenue less than even European counterparts at the time, which, as I mentioned before, if you uh, in, in the in the literature and state formation in Europe, people do not contest that states actually finance war through foreign credit and uh, increasing tariffs. Right? And there seems to be something uh, in, in Latin America kind of unexplored in this literature, which is the fact that because of the kind of geopolitics of the region and, uh, and the fact that all of the, you know, most of the revenue tends to come from single ports that are also the capital cities of these countries and, and whatnot, or uh, there is a, people have been missing that the, the, the huge effect that uh, war dynam certain war dynamics like these blockades that I have been mentioning might have had on, on, on this, uh, on, the, on the probability or the possibility of these countries acquiring revenue uh, through, through increasing tax uh, tariffs or, or through domestic duties. So when you s take a look at systematically basically the all of the wars, these are more limited, not just military disputes, but wars that happened in Latin America in the 20th century, in the 19th century, and you look at the, uh, basically the naval blockades in this column. So you can see that in most of these wars, at least one of the contenders was blockaded. At least its port was blockaded and for, for most of the conflict. Some conflict like the, the War of the Pacific, for example, was basically a race between Lima and Valparaiso, right, the Peru, uh, and Chile, and, and Peru, to see which country would blockade the other first. And obviously, if one country blockaded the other, uh, then you couldn't collect any foreign revenue anymore. This, of course, happens a lot more when with European blockades of Latin American ports, which also was one of the major, uh, was a major dynamic in the 19th century, and, and happened in many of these military center states that I mentioned before, right? So, this work, as I mentioned, like the Buenos Aires blockade of the 1940s. Um, and finally, the other thing that we haven't considered as much is how prominent and, and usual the defaults uh, of foreign debt were in, the, uh, in, in Latin America at the time. So this other uh, column here has the proportion of countries that were, uh, during the war, in a situation of default of their, foreign, of their sovereign debt. And you cannot probably see the numbers from there, but you know it's and most of the time, even both of the contenders were in a situation of foreign uh, of the default of the foreign debt. Sometimes this was related to the fact that the, the port was blockaded, and because of the they couldn't access foreign revenue, they had to default the foreign debt. But the important point here is that for most of these wars, Latin American countries couldn't access new loans. They, this this was also blocked as their ports, right? so that. These dynamics, apparently, and this is what comes up in the statistical model, models that it, uh, might or should have forced them to tax domestically. Okay. So this is the content of this other chapter, which is about this moment of fighting wars. And uh, all of this is kind of part of this bigger project, which uh, has uh, or book project which has this theory chapters a bit of what I talked at the beginning, <laughs> this post-war period effects. The second thing I mentioned, and, and then now this this chapter on the on the immediate effects of warfare and, and state formation dynamics. Um, so that's to give you a broader <laughs> understanding of the project. Um, and then there are a couple of chapters that are case studies, like the Paraguayan War, the War of the Pacific. And uh, where I try to illustrate how these dynamics take place in the short term. Um, and then I can talk a bit more about the specific taxes that were applied in this context and, and 
and make more of a qualitative argument for 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 what I try to depict more uh, statistically or summarize more statistically in this chapter. So yeah, with that, I think I might be a bit yeah beyond the time. Thank you for your attention and the feedback that I might gather. Very much appreciate being here. Thank you. Collect, right? I collect some questions and come back to you. Um, so, sorry, are there any questions? <laughs> no, you have to use these. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Apparently, if not, the people who are online will be able to. Okay. So, thank you very much, Luis. First of all, I would like to say that I'm a really fan of your work. So, uh, my questions are from a fan of your work. <laughs> so, you must take it like that. Okay. So, first of all, I'm not sure that. When looking at your work and looking at Latin America history throughout 19th century, I don't think that the, the important thing is victory, but losing the war. And it is true that in, in your econometric analysis, you use both winners and losers, but in your case studies, you look at the worst examples like Peru and Paraguay. Peru and Paraguay, the, the effect of the war was really, really uh, negative, isn't it? So. I'm not so sure if the problem is winning the war or losing the war. Uh, losing, uh, losing the war was uh, really, really bad for Latin American countries. When looking at uh, winning the war, why I'm not so sure that winning the war was so important? Because when you look, when you look for instance, at the evolution of those taxes that were created during this war time, they were eliminated also after the war. The Chilean case is the most paradigmatic in this in this sense, like you have this income tax, but once the war ended, they use natural resource taxes in order to finance the, the state. And this is also related with the indicators that you use. It is true that you can see uh, an increase in revenues per capita, but also uh, an, an increase in railways millage, but this can be the result, not necessarily of state capacity, but market forces. Winning the war was important because it provided peace and peace was important to export led growth so i'm not so sure how much of the effect that we are looking at is the result of a, a state capacity or market forces and um, yeah and that will be for this thank you Thanks. Very interesting. Uh, I'm not a Latin Americanist, so I have a very naive question. Could you talk a little about the type of states we had uh, right after independence? I mean, I'm thinking of Gran Colombia. Was that even a proper state or just a very loose federation of different territories held by different armies and generals? I'm, and I'm really, it's a very naive question, but I, I need a bit more historical context. Uh, this would be helpful. Thanks. Thank you uh, for your talk. Um, my question, I had uh, two short questions. One is about the, how does your work relate to Cameron Ties and his data set on external internal rivalry? Have you separated the two in your work? Uh, and the second question is can you, <clears throat> this is just speculation, but Latin America, like uh, the African continent, is a place where you have few secessionist wars. You have a few, uh, to my knowledge, there's not a lot in Latin America. How does this relate to the overall story you're trying to tell mm -hmm. about state formation and kind of the hardness of colonial boundaries in uh, Latin America? Wait one more and then I give the mic. Thank you. Super interesting work. Um, I'm just wondering how many wars do you need to win um, in order to have, let's say, greater state capacity than the losers? I mean, does that have to be consecutive? Um, what happens when you win a war and then you lose a war? Um, I mean, is the losing the, 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 the thing that completely eradicates um, the accumulation of uh, capacity in the previous like, T0, say? So, I mean, those are some of the questions that uh, came to my mind with respect to the state capacity and state building. Um, the second question has to do with this um, intra-elite conflict and the eruption of war. 
how do in the post uh, conflict period do winners and losers negotiate these conflicts differently and how does that actually affect state building and state capacity in the aftermath like do these conflicts and winners are they negotiated differently and perhaps in a more redistributive way that basically buys them off so that basically there's no domestic push to, to topple the, the winner and there's basically, you know, a, a consolidation of political power, at least for a given time period, as opposed to losers where, you know, constant conflict and um, ongoing in internal fights basically undermine state capacity even more. Thank you. Well, these were all great questions, so let's see if I can tackle them all. So let's start with the how many words, that's an interesting one. Because of course this, this argument has a normative twist to it and then it's, it's, uh, it's uncomfortable to, to think about it in that way, right? But there is also some truth to it. So for example, Chile is, the, is nowadays considered a country with the with the highest state capacity in the region, or one of the countries with the highest state capacity in the region. And Chile is actually a history of repeated success. Chile famously consolidated their, their state in the 1830s and have a, a constitution that lasted for the rest of the century, and, and all of its governments finished their terms and whatnot. And this was right after the consolidation of the conservative consensus after the war of the, of the confederation against the Peru-Bolivian confederation. In the, it's the late 30s context. And then this is a case of a, a country that confronted a second big war and also won it. And you can kind of see how the trajectory of this particular country was particularly steep in terms of consolidating their state uh, in relation to the number of. Right? Then you have countries that go in, in this, this more contradictory trajectory that you were depicting, and, and for example, Argentina and Brazil are examples of this to a certain extent. So for example, our, in the case of Argentina, this goes a bit to how the states looked like initially, right? Uh, there was a, a very important attempt to, towards centralization and state building in the 1820s and, uh, and the government of a president called Rivadavia, the, I think the first government uh, president of Argentina. Uh, and this was basically shattered precisely by the defeat of Argentina, the law, what in Argentina, in Argentina history we, we think of as the loss of the Banda Oriental, or what is currently Uruguay, due to the war with Brazil. That, so there was a, an impulse for state building, then basically this, this project was shattered a bit by defeat. <coughs> this initiated a long period of domestic strife between things like Unitarios and federales, people that went to centralize power and monetarios or federalists. And this conflict was brought to an end in the 1960s, in the 1860s, precisely when victory that was sent this after the Paraguayan War and also mobilization for the Paraguayan War resolved this deep entrenched contradictions between these two parties. Right? Similar process applies to Brazil, but basically with the Pedro I, the, the first emperor of Brazil, fights this war, loses it. Then Brazil is shattered into pieces. There is a rebellion of the particular provinces in the south that secede. There was a lot of secession in the 19th century from in all of this country. Um, secession its attempts, like basically Argentina before this Paraguayan war, at some point this domestic threat was so, so important that Argentina didn't exist at all. There was a confederation of provinces and, and, and Buenos Aires. And we had two separate countries for almost a decade. Um, the provinces in the south of Brazil, in particular Rio Grande do Sul, they also declare independence, basically, and fought a war against the central government of some 15 years until mobilization again for war against Rosas in Buenos Aires. And eventually, the, the country kind of consolidates in a similar juncture. Right? Now, the, what, what are the elite dynamics that underpin this process? This is, this is actually quite interesting. And the way I think of it is basically that there, is, there was in all of these countries this tension essentially between central elites and peripheral elites. The central, central elites being those interested in state formation and more taxation, consolidation of the national institutions, like the army, whilst these peripheral elites were more preoccupied with uh, maintaining the autonomy of their feuds inside 
countries and and were more of this provincial release or um, uh, in ways. Um, now, what I think, basically, if you were to summarize this process, happened was that during, during this 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 moments of mobilization for war, these two elites were or basically were forced to come together under this uh, this, uh, this state forming uh, process. They were they both were led to recognize because of the national common national identity and the ex actual existence of this foreign foe that taxation and mobilization to a certain extent, centralization of power in the national state to a certain extent was necessary. Their feuds were put into parentheses during this external war. And at the moment of the resolution of this war, this resulted in a kind of equilibrium between central and peripheral elites in the post-war period. And this equilibrium result on the favor of central elites if, in the end, paying for this army was seen as important for uh, having kept the integrity, territorial integrity of the country, protecting the country from this external enemy. In, 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 in I know, wars that ended up with the foreign invasion, like the Paraguayan War, where Argentine and, and, and Brazilian troops were in, in Asuncion in Paraguay, or same thing with Lima during the War of the Pacific and Chilean troops. Then, of course, the peri peripheral elites that were natural allies of the occupying forces were boosted up. Right? And those people that were against taxation uh, and against uh, the consolidation of a strong army and national taxes were boosted up by even the, the occupation forces in some cases. But in some cases, they collapse by their sheer incapacity to fight these wars, right? And, and they, they lose, they lost legitimacy. So that, you know, that those, I think that underlying you know, uh, rivalries uh, between these these two theoretical you know, sectors of the of elites um, were resolved by this structural external shock in this in these ways. So that that's the story that I think one could, uh, in a way, replicate in all of these cases. Admittedly, with different intensity, depending on you know, the, the different experiences. So there are wars, um, like it was, it was said, like the Paraguayan War, the War of the Pacific, that are kind of paradigmatic by their dimensions and how they, uh, you can see this very clearly, right? Uh, but to a certain extent, you could see these mechanisms, maybe to a lesser degree, in, in lesser conflicts. Right? Um, now, regarding how in my work, or let's, let's look back maybe, whether losing the war is, is devastating and is the actual effect. So fundamentally, I, I would agree with what you, you've said in the sense that the, so I, I cannot show the slide again, but no, no problem. It's, but you remember that basically that there was kind of a trajectory and then there was a divergence and the divergence is, you know, is the defeat, right? So what we're measuring in this, in these models is basically the effect of the defeat precisely because victory doesn't have as much, I mean, theoretically, it allows the state to continue in the same trajectory of state building in which it already was, which is, you know, was triggered by mobilization. So it is true that if you think about Chile, you wouldn't think, that, okay, Chile imposed these taxes and, they, and then consolidated those same taxes, and, and but you would expect that the effect takes place in the, in the defeated side and then Chile somehow maintained. Now there is another aspect to your question, which is that cer certain certain taxes that were imposed during the war period were then dismantled, so that you would imagine the process more of okay, we are building state capacity, but then it was dismantled everywhere, something like more in this in this way. So what I would say there is that this is actually you can something that you can see all over the world, also in Europe. So the type of taxation and the type of mobilization that takes place or spend you know, uh, state expenditures that take place during war. Are completely different from the ones that take place during the during the post-war period. That's why I focus more on railroads and revenue and things that are, could be traced over the long term. Because if I, for instance, thought of state capacity as this kind of taxes, or I thought of state capacity as the size of a military, I would see what you just described. If you put the size of a military, it goes up, and then the Chilean, perhaps it ratchets at a higher level than Peru, so they, 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 both armies are the same, and then Chile stays here. But you would see the bump. So. So what, I think what is clear to uh, is important to disentangle here is that there are certain types of state capacity that are deleve, developed during the war, preparation for war period or the war itself, and then there there are these other aspects which remain more in the long term. Right? 
Now, these other aspects don't necessarily need to be of the type of this kind of taxes that you were mentioning, right? They're directed toward the leads, direct taxes, ever. Um, I think the other side of the coin is thinking about how the Chilean state differed from Peru after after the after the war of the Pacific, right? And then you would realize that actually one of the clear effects of the war was to allow the Chilean state to be able to impose these taxes on revenues that came out of, of this, uh, these extractive industries, right? Or this natural. And what you think of as the market forces driving the development of the states in the late 19th century, actually, if you incorporate this view, is the effects of the market forces in depending on whether you control your territory and are able to secure this capitalist investment in your country. Right? So the same thing happened in Paraguay. So Paraguay had a booming, I don't know, mate industry in the, in the 1860s. And, and Peru also had a booming uh, guano industry in the 1870s and, and uh, you know, mining industry also in the, in the also Bolivia you know, extracted some revenue from, from, from the region. Uh, but after the war, due to the consolidation of the territory and uh, also the, the control over the territory because you now could enforce law on, uh, on larger extents of the territory because you had a large army and security force. And whatnot. Then that allowed the states to extract. So it's a kind of a chicken and egg thing, but I think it's clear that if you think about how this impacted these countries, in, in, at least in this way, there is some, uh, yeah, this is, this side of the process, I think, is, is uh, but I don't know if you have a, an immediate reaction to that, because it's an interesting point. But on the type of states after independence, uh, that, that's also, that's a good one, because I think people think of Latin America also as a, as a, a tabula rasa before independence or something like some, sometimes, right? I think it's important to, 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 to realize, actually, that Latin America was part of this Iberian empires that were also fighting wars in, in Europe. And most of the money that they used for fighting those wars also came from taxation and administration of these territories, which were an integral part of, of Spain and Portugal. So I don't think independence is kind of a discontinuity where you have the states that didn't actually exist and the people had to make everything from, from scratch. Uh, I think you can even see uh, a war led to state formation in the colonial era. Uh, so for example, Buenos Aires became the capital of the vice royalty of the River Plate of uh, Rio de la Plata in 1776, <laughs> well, around 1770, I think 1774 or 76. Um, and this was uh, as a result of uh, actually the threat after World Seven Years of uh, War in Europe, of the threat of the Portuguese expanding toward colonial Sacramento, which is in southern Uruguay. So the the whole administration with the so-called Borbonic reforms in the Spanish world or uh, in, in, in Portu Portugal, they call it the Reformas Fonbalinas. There was a, a whole change in the administration, also in terms of like, the taxation and the administration of, uh, of local municipalities and. Uh, uh, but also in new taxes, and which was kind of a result of restructuring this, this continent for the purposes of enhancing war fighting in Europe and in the Americas. Um, so that means that there was some sort of state infrastructure there that the new states could tap into, right? But then, uh, of course, there was the, a lot of fighting that took place afterwards. But there was a strong base, I think, for state, for whatever, you know, all of these dimensions of state formation that came from, from, from colonial times. Not the least, the very territorial kind of shape that these countries took, because basically after the independence in Latin America, because of the, the, uh, the principle that was widely accepted by all of the elites of these capitals, was the so-called principle of uti possidetis, or which is in Latin for something like, what you had, you will we continue to have, or, uh, which is the principle of international law according to what the extension of these countries would take the shape of the colonial administrative units before them. Right? So then there were uh, fights for sections of territory that were not clearly Chilean or Bolivian or Argentina, uh, 
but in a way, the process doesn't start from scratch as maybe in Europe in the 1300s, right? It's more like it's something that was already happening. Yeah, I mean, in my limited understanding of Europe, I see that this was basically the same thing, right? That you have this, this caudillos, European caudillos that were the kings of the 15th, 16th century. The borders were unclear and they were trying to pull as many resources as they could and expand and control the territories. So I think the process was quite similar and the equivalent of those times would be Napoleon in Europe and basically you know, something. Now this project that were too ambitious territorially collapsed eventually into several countries. So Bolivar, at some point Bol Bolivar thought he would govern until even Bolivia because it was the patron of, that's why the name of the country Bolivia comes from, you know, the Bolivians recognizing that the country, you know, owed its independence to Bolivar. Right? So that, that was an, an imaginary potential unit that never existed, and the great Colombia existed for some decade, and then it collapsed into the states that we know today. But the, yeah, uh, very soon though, the Latin American states is stabilized in this state, interstate system that we know today, right? And all of this, we, like I showed you, is from a period where basically these units had stabilized, right? So you already had Ecuador and Colombia and all these countries around. Um, okay, and then the one about Cameron ties. So Cameron uh, has this couple of articles from the early 2000s where he looks at the, at the 20th century. So I see my work basically looking at the 19th century for what he tried to do in the, but in the same spirit. Right? He, he has uh, these panels, and, and, but he's looking at you know, overall taxation in, in terms of, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, basically tax, tax pressure and tax revenue and, um, and the impact of different things. So because you didn't have, this is the main thing that I recognize to this anti belicist approaches. It is true that after 1930, after the Chaco War in Latin America, there are basically no wars. Right? Uh, so that that is a correct kind of observation and therefore you wouldn't expect war to have any effect on state formation in the, in the 20th century. On the other hand, you know, that kind of explains another intuition of the literature, which is that there hasn't been variation in state capacity levels during the 20th century. So another thing that all of these people recognize is that Uruguay, Chile, Argentina have been always among the highest capacity states and others like Peru and Bolivia have been always like low capacity states until since the 1900s. And this coincides with the period of no war. Now because Cameron faces this period of no war, he, he is looking at the effect of rivalries on, on taxation. This rivalry is a different concept. It's, it's whether two countries don't get along, basically. They have bad diplomatic relations and a hypothesis of conflict eventually between the two of them. Um, and he finds that actually there is an effect of rivalry. So he's the, actual, the only actual Bellicist author in the, of the whole of this uh, literature, uh, if you want to think about it that way. Um, so he also looks at the interaction of, of civil wars and, and, and international rivalry. And, the, and what, he, what he's trying to test there is whether civil war has a positive effect or not in state capacity. I, I think of it completely different uh, in, in, and there is no way of reconciling this in, in, the, in the framework that I just presented. Because for me, uh, civil war is in a way a symptom of state weakness or tensions that arise during the fighting external war, but not a war that, a type of war that by in, in itself should lead to more or less state capacity. And this is kind of in line with a lot of research that is being done today, I think, in, in, on, on the effect of civil war and state capacity that finds contradictory effects. Uh, because I think it's basically, it's, it's kind of part of this equilibrium I was mentioning before. If you have a weak state and you have constant fighting between Unitarians and Federalists, you will have a civil war there, maybe a civil war in another couple of years. But the real war that will change the, 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 the fate of the state as the sort of treatment has to be a war that leads to sufficient mobilization of the nation against this kind of external war, right? So it, it leads to the imposition of these broad, extensive taxes and conscription and, uh, you know, increasing the, the army in the, in the numbers of the South thousands, right? And this usually doesn't happen with civil war. Um, but what, what Cameron finds 
overall is, is in line with the external war leading to state formation dynamic, right? Because sometimes civil wars have a negative effect, I think, uh, when, when they happen alone, but if they are interacted with, with rivalry, they have a positive effect, and there's a positive effect of rivalry. So it's, I think it's overall kind of the same intuition. So what he would find that, for example, in these this cases where I find civil wars and militarized interstate disputes happen at the same time, those would be the case of the interaction, right? Those would be the, the cases, the, you know, the country years picked up by, the, by this interaction. And those would have a positive effect just as I would think they have, right? In this. So these are civil wars. Anyways. Um, yeah, and I think I addressed the secessionist war point already. So. Um, yeah, he's muted. So, uh, Patrick, I think you have to type your question here. Oh, no, there you are. Okay. So you can. Oh. Okay. No, my apologies. I didn't want to, uh, uh, yeah, unmute myself until I knew I was called up. Um, no, thank you very much, sir, uh, uh, for your presentation. I was um, curious. Uh, my background is as a historian. Um, working on a political science uh, a doctorate at George Mason, but I am curious as to uh, the effects perhaps that the Monroe Doctrine, the um, uh, United States as the uh, gorilla in the room uh, in the Western Hemisphere, if that has any effect um, on uh, the state capacity building in Latin American nations, in particular the Monroe Doctrine, uh, and its influences on those nations? That's a good question. So, well, maybe this relates a bit to the to what I was saying about how wars disappeared from the hemisphere in a sense. So I think there is clearly something going on in the sense of the Monroe Doctrine trying to push back European interventions in the form of these blockades that I mentioned in the mid 19th century which were a source of domestic mobilization and probably initial state capacity uh, uh, form, formation in that sense. Then after the Hispanic American War and in the early 20th, 20th century, basically with the consolidation of American hegemony and the actual kind of fulfillment of the, of the, of the, what the, on road doctrine and vision, which was like no no more European interventions after the, the blockade of Venezuela in 1904. Uh, basically, war disappears from this region, with the only exception of this Leticia War and this Chaco War. And and then you when you see no more war in, in the Americas, you kind of see this process of state formation. Uh, in, in a way, freezing, right? That, that, as I was saying. So it, I think that's that's part of the story, like the, because the Monroe Doctrine, of course, is a 200 years thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's how I would think about it broadly. But I, I don't, I don't know. If your question pointed to some other dimension of the of the issue. Patrick, are you still there? Oh, uh, yes, sir. No, my apologies. The internet. Uh not my friend right now um no uh so as a back brief to make sure i understood you correctly um the monroe doctrine really did not have any teeth to keep out uh to keep out european influence like you had mentioned the uh, the blockade i think i heard you correctly um of brazil uh however once uh u.s hegemony did um uh, in the Western Hemisphere did finally come to fruition, uh, that's when we actually see its effects on uh, uh, Latin American uh, state capacity. Is that a correct understanding, sir? Yes. So basically, the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, this is when Monroe expresses this, this idea that European power shouldn't intervene uh, in the Western Hemisphere. This is. Uh, this has had little impact, of course, initially, right? Because the U.S. didn't have any power to actually enforce this this, this doctrine. This is 
20 years even before the, the war between the U.S. and Mexico, the U.S. Uh, didn't extend toward the, to, to, toward the Pacific, and uh, so the U.S. was an important, say, great power at the time, even an impending great power maybe, uh, but not of, uh, any, you know, the dimensions that could, in a way, uh, push back the European influence in the in the continent. So there are certain critical tensions that, that make the the, the you know, the, the, the weakness of the Monroe Doctrine very evident. For, for example, during the U.S. the American Civil War, right? So, so during the American Civil War in the 60s, uh, you will see the Spanish trying to take Spain trying to take back the Dominican Republic. Spain invades Peru and takes the Chincha Islands in Peru. and goes to war with all, all of the countries in the South American Pacific. Mexico invades Mexico invades uh, sorry France invades Mexico and puts an emperor in, in the Mexican throne. And uh, so Europeans are intervening all the time. So there, there's clearly no effect of the Monroe Doctrine in practice uh, until the late 19th century. Right? So, uh, and and as, as this expression of will, the kind of the law, doctrine of international law, uh, it starts to evolve before and leads to certain important effects in terms of, again, law. Uh, but uh, if we are thinking about war itself and whether it was it was stopping this kind of war. It, it actually didn't work until the, uh, the early, early 20th century. But when, once it worked, maybe it, it, this is one of the reasons why it completely declined, I would say, in, in the Americas, and, and you would see less state formation. Right? But, so that would be my broad take on that one, but it's a very big question. No, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. This Monroe Doctrine, so, but in all, I mean, the Monroe Doctrine goes back to Bravo Doctrine, right? So I was wondering whether these blockades, right? So they were good, or, or they were a mechanism for state formation, but also for norm uh, creation in Latin America, right? Because uh, before Monroe, it was Drago saying, there's no way you can interfere military, military in a country. To, to, for that country to honor its debt, right? But that's, yeah. Okay, so Luis, thank you very much for your presentation, for everything. Uh, thank you all for being today. And um, thank you again. <laughs> it was a pleasure having you. <laughs> <laughs>